money. <laughs> so welcome back to another episode of Wak Nation. I know it's been a while for um, our followers and listeners, so thank you so much for being patient with us. For today's guest, we have the legendary uh, Muhammad Saeed of XMNA. Muhammad Saeed is a Pakistani-American writer, speaker, and political activist. He created the Ex-Muslims of North America Advocacy Group in 2013, which seeks to normalize religious dissent and to help former Muslims leave the religion by linking them to support networks. Now, that's what it says about you in Wikipedia, Mohammed. Do you want to add, <laughs> subtract? <laughs> I go on and on. Who can talk about themselves? Of course. I would. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to also say uh, my personal uh, relationship with uh, Mohammed uh, since I joined uh, XMNA few years now, I can't even remember how long ago, but uh, we did have uh, the interview together. And uh, that's when I first met uh, Mohammed Z, uh in person. But uh, yeah. Actually, so, not in person, virtually. We, I don't virtually. think we have met yet in person. True. Hopefully but at the next this, software conference. that is. as it gets in the 21st century, I think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now I disagree. <laughs> you should have been down here last uh, <laughs> July or June when we had, were at Pride. <laughs> True. Oh, yes. That's yes, true. Yes, that yes, is so true. And Capricorn. And you missed the Capricorn. We're going to talk about that later. Don't yes, talk okay, to All right? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. We've got we to gotta bring back. Yeah, that. Right. So uh, I think you guys have the, the agenda. So, I mean, we can, we can, did you uh, want to add anything to that uh, Wikipedia introduction, um, Hamid? <laughs> <laughs> or did you so have... I would uh, say that the point of ex Muslim North America generally is to make it, to normalize this and normalize the idea that ex Muslims exist. And it's been, what, seven years since we started? And I would say to a great extent, we have been insanely successful. If you remember seven years ago, the idea of somebody being an ex-Muslim was relatively rare. People thought about it, but it wasn't in the mainstream discourse. And now it's pretty much everywhere. You have groups popping up in Australia, in Europe. We have the Somali group that popped up recently. So things have changed dramatically in just the span of seven years. And one of the biggest change, I think, is because we and others were able to leverage a lot more people coming out. And... Mm -hmm. Seeing hum human beings out there changes the perspective dramatically. You lose that feeling of I'm the only one, I'm alone. Absolutely. Right. I think it's a good time for me to interject here in this introduction that it was actually you um, seeing a video of yours about like seven years ago or something like that um, that helped me realise that um, I was an ex-Muslim. Like, I, I guess for me, for years, I have a story really similar to Imtia Shams. Shams. So for years, you know, you have these questions, you have these, um, I grew up, you know, in a really religious environment. Anyway, cut a long story short, I used to identify as agnostic Muslim. So when I remember, you know, because there was no such t term as ex-Muslim. So back in the day, I used to tell people, like, I'm like, you know, when, when my Muslim friends went around to, to my, you know, all the Aussie friends, I'll be like, totally don't believe in this stuff. I'm agnostic. <laughs> um, but culturally Muslim, you know what I mean? Like whenever my family and stuff would move away, you know? Um, and it wasn't until I actually, and I was actually really set on that whole agnostic Muslim thing. So that just meant to me that I um, didn't believe in any of the, um, you know, Edicts part. of Islam. Yeah, scripture part of it, yeah. But I participated in, like, the, the Ramadans and the Eid. Um, but it wasn't until I watched something of yours and then you were talking about, um, you know, like, just dropping the label altogether and just, just why even identify with Islam, kind of, and just say, calling yourself an ex-Muslim. And I don't know, just the clarity at which um, you had kind of come to your own dis um, conclusion. And I guess I'd seen so much of myself, um, you know, I guess... Um, it wasn't like you were a convert that just left Islam. You know, you, we kind of grew up the same. We, we all yeah. grew up in the Islamic environment. So I was like, yeah, I mean, how much right? Like, why am I calling myself a Muslim? Like, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that was my aha moment. So that's why for me, like, this, this interview is, um, like, thank you so much for making the time to um, grace us with your me. presence. That's because, great. yeah. Yes, that's, that's yeah, it's been so important in my life, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like all the way in Australia, Mohammed. All the way in Australia. <laughs> Influencing us all. Yep, to Johanna. Yeah. But you know what? The culture part, touching that in particular, like yeah. my perspective generally is that we all have our own cultures and Islam is yeah. erasing them. You have your own Somali culture. If you go back 30 years, right. 100 years, 200 years, even 2,000 years, Somali culture predates the Islamic culture. Why should our individual right. cultures be erased based on this religion? Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. Yeah, that's very true. But so speaking on that, how about uh, did you? Um, what kind of encounters uh, have you uh, seen with the Somali 
especially Somali ex-Muslims, as the president <laughs> of uh, XML. Let's pull out the violin. Let's pull out the violin because it's probably some epic stories. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of insane stories. And for <laughs> whatever reason, I don't know why, but in my experience working with ex-Muslims, the most insane stories tend to be Somali. Um, I mean, keep it true to it. You, we like to be number one pirates. in everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you guys, I'm sure, are, uh, know Jamal. Um, yep. So with Jamal, yep, like yep. he was the first um, Somali ex-Muslim that I encountered. And we sort of have a screening process where we try to get to know somebody before allowing them to attend our events. And with Jamal, he, was, he had gone through a lot. Like his family had actually physically abused him and um, he had cut himself off from every uh, brown or Muslim context entirely. And the reason was what he went through. And when we uh, touched base, we talked a few times. I met him like two or three different times before he, he was comfortable enough. We didn't have a video chat. We actually hung out at bars multiple times because he was so scared of what the consequence of reaching out to any environment like ours is because he was worried it would be a trap or something like that. And oh, then the yeah. first time he actually showed up at an event, um, he, it was actually an Eve party that we threw. And he was, uh, he, after the event, I talked to him and asked him what he thought. And he said that before he had entered, he was waiting outside for about five minutes, pondering whether he should enter or not. And <clears throat> at the end of it, he was, these were my people. And it changed his perspective yeah. dramatically. Um, there was another Somali ex-Muslim that was at that event as well. And uh, both of them uh, talked about the fact that we, what we were doing was so interesting and powerful that they wanted to replicate that. And that's when they created the Reddit X Somali community. They actually did that in my living room <laughs> during uh, that party. <laughs> wow. So the Somali X Muslim Reddit was born in uh, your in your living room. That is amazing. <laughs> that's amazing because they got like over I think fifteen hundred subscribers. It's got so many subscribers. So shout out to and actually one of the guys um, in Wak Nation is one of the admins. So um, yeah, shout out to the guys over at Reddit. That is crazy, though. That's a, that's a, that's a funny story. That's actually a good, good, <laughs> good story. Uh, and Jamal from there went to like this pioneer of everything in the Somali community. From what I understand, he's done an insane yeah. amount of work. Oh, absolutely. yeah, yeah. He's a really cool guy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Shout out to, shout absolutely. out to Jamal. Yeah. Mahad no, as well great. too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> do you believe that? Um, I feel like. I don't, and I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm right. You guys correct me. But I feel like um, along with the Pakistani, Afghani, Somalis are up there with the, uh, in terms of activism, right? In terms of... Yeah, you guys definitely punch above your weight class by far. Like there aren't any <laughs> Somalis as, as active as you guys are. Yeah, so... That's well, even without touching Ayan, Ayan like yeah. besides that, there are a lot of Somalis that are out there, which to me is very heartening. That's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, that's great. Because that's the other thing. It's, uh, what are your thoughts on Ayan Hirsi Ali, which was ahead of her time, right? In terms of... Oh, which Ayan Hirsi Ali? Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah, that's the so true. That's a good point. I guess, I guess so many hats point. that she has, like, um, as a victim of Islam, what she went through as an ex-Muslim activist herself, um, mm -hmm. what happened to her as somebody that is talking about the issue of Islamism. That's a different hat that she wears. Um, <clears throat> and each of those has different ramifications, I would say. And then you also have her acting as a women's rights activist. And I would say, if you guys have the time, we should walk through all of those. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I just want to take it one step back for a second, though, guys. Um, I just wanted to clarify, with the Somali community, the reason why the Somali community is probably so vocal and um, probably... At the, we've always, if you think about it, been at the forefront of the ex-Muslim movement from the time of Ayan, really. She's our, mm. I guess, prophet guiding us um, through, right? Um you know, the thing is, with our community, it's such, um, Islam really manifests violently. Um, we're very, like, we're a really zealous community, um, probably even more so than the Afghani community. Uh, people, when they think of, like, extremist Somali, I'm oh, sorry, extremist Islamic communities, they often think of, you know, Afghanistan, the Burqa, or, mm -hmm. you know, Pakistan, or, you know, Arabs and stuff like that. But when you're an actual Muslim and you actually know the Ummah, you actually know that Pakistanis are actually, like, yes, they are pretty religious and stuff like that. But then, for example, not all the women wear the hijab, exactly. They, they kind of wore a more diverse different style. More diverse, exactly. Whereas in the Somali community, we don't have that. It is, you, it's conform or die. Do you get what I'm saying? All the women wear hijab. 
98% of the women are female uh, have uh, got female genital mutilation or whatever. So yeah. it's like, it's like, it's, it's not like the conformity is like almost absolute. There's only a handful of people that would um, dare to kind of, for example, as women in the Somali community. And this is why, for example, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch back around on this, but about hijabi models. But if you look at the Somali community, you, what you'll find is it's very few people that have the um, audacity to be liberal. And liberal in the Somali context is not wearing hijab, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, not wearing a skirt. When I was growing up, wearing pants was offensive to my elders. You know, they, they thought that was just such a westernization. Forget about not wearing a hijab. Forget about not, you know. So, and you, anyways, and, and you were born in Australia. <laughs> and I was born and raised in Australia. Yeah, exactly. So, so think about um, that for a minute, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think in, um, in the Pakistani communities also, I, um, and, and, and maybe I'll get some flack for this, but I think in terms of um, education, they surpass us, right? I mean, in terms of... Uh, there's a lot, there, there is a lot more education as well. And, and you know, for better or for worse, there's uh, others. I, and I'm not sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mohammed, but I think there's, Chris, there's Christian Pakistanis. There's, yes, uh, yeah. is there any Pakistanis? I see, Bibi. Pakistani? I see Bibi. Pakistanis, uh, but they're a very small minority. Uh, very they've small been minority. persecuted so, for so long that they've either fled the country or they've converted. There's forcible conversions going on. So, the numbers are negligible, like uh, it's less than 1% of the population now. Is there any Hindu uh, Pakistanis? Yeah, there are. Yes. Okay, so there and you go. So treated that, as second class citizens, it's terrible. Well, absolutely, treated. absolutely. But, but in the, Somali, their existence there exists. is there. Their existence yeah. is there, right? It, yeah. it, you see them, right? In Somalis, that just doesn't exist. It just is. It's, it's 99%. One meme I've run across uh, time and again dealing with Somalis is that they view that if you. If you've left Islam, you're no longer Somali. Like the Somali yes. identity is so tightly yes. intertwined with the Islamic identity. Absolutely. Is your Somaliness and uh, Islamness the same, right? Yeah, go ahead. Put it this way. You, you can't even be a liberal Somali. Um, sorry, you can't be a liberal Muslim in the Somali context. Like, for example, and liberal again, you know, all these terms are really, I mean, I really don't mean anything nowadays. But anyways, I'll, I'll just use them for the argument. <laughs> uh, so liberal in Somalia is, for example, there was a sheikh. Um, no, sorry. He wasn't a sheikh. He was a professor. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I just wanted to kind of piggyback off Khan's point. Literacy matters, education matters. In Somalia, we have a problem where I think there's like 23 or 33 percent literacy, you know what I'm saying? Like all over. I, I really do think education matters, and that's part of the reason why the Somali community is even more zealous than any other Muslim community. I feel like it's the reason why Islam is more dangerous in the Somali context because we have a lack of educated minds, you know. Um, so going back to this um, professor, so he was saying, so in Northern Somalia, I'm from Northern Somalia, we're both from Northern Somalia, you know, it's extremely dry drought, you know, um, there's, I mean, the, the, it's an arid land, it's um, actually kind of similar to the, uh, the climate in Australia, just constant droughts um, and stuff. So every year we have these continuous, the, the same sort of problems of, you know, lack of water, no food, or whatever, you know, uh, yeah, floods, ongoing, the, um, issues. So this professor of whatever, I'm not sure what he was the professor of, but he just said, guys, um, you know, like, cause every year without a, without fail, these Somalis get together and they're like, let's, let's pray <laughs> some, for some rain guys. Let's, <laughs> let's make some, to, uh, like, they're like, you know, obviously like prayer teams are like, we're not praying enough. You put <laughs> hijab on. This is the reason why we're having the drafts again, again, without fail in 2020. Right. So this is in 2018. This guy's like, Hey guys, little idea i was just thinking why don't we maybe reflect on some science and you know i mean there's other countries that have got like desalination they're like what they literally this man is on death row this man was collected arrested and he's still on death row like the audacity to mm. suggest science there, there has been for fairness sake the for fairness sake there has been some uh, university professors in karachi i think or and it was in pakistan where they were either executed or, you know, murdered jailed, or right? executed and uh, it, like assassinated yeah. is fairly common. Okay, so there yeah, you go. These are cards, these yeah. are bright minds that are just saying, "Hey, how about we get to get along? Like, how dare yeah, you? Yeah. No, well, how about we along. get science? How about the audacity to mention science to these people? Like, so yeah, this man is on. Um, so that's Somalia for you. So the, yeah. he was just trying to help them get rain. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So there you so, go. 
I don't so know what your impression is, uh, Muhammad, uh, of, of, of Somalis, ex-Muslims, and how that came about, and how you thought. And, and of course, with Ayan Hirsi Ali being... But I think Ayan Hirsi Ali, in this context, I think she is her own entity. She's yeah, her yeah. own So state, she predated right? all of it. She was a pioneer, but yeah. she doesn't represent the broader movement within Somalis, or generally speaking. Um, so one thing I would say, I was, I was saying that a lot of people are very, very brave, considering the consequences that often a company coming out as a Somali ex-Muslim. Um, so with most of the people in the early days when we started off that came out, there were consequences. They went through that. And I think it's gotten a lot better now. But for example, in the beginning, one of our guys, um, we had an Eid, it was a New Year's party. We had through a New Year's party and the Somali guy was in the background. And um, his family was attacked as a result of that. In a video, he wasn't in the foreground, he wasn't featured. His face was just visible in the background. And uh, as a result of that, within 24 hours, there were on forums discussions about who he was. And another 24 hours or so later, his family was actually attacked. Um, wow. And he had to go back in the closet. He wasn't open or anything. He was just there. Was the that background. in the West? Where, 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 where was his family in, in the West? But the family mm-hmm. was in Somalia. He was oh, in D.C. Place. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, no, I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I've, I've received personally myself, like I've received death threats, rape threats. It's gotten so bad for me that I've had to go to like the, um, like the senior Australian, you know, like the FBI, yeah. but for Australia. Yeah. Um, and they've, and they've, it, cause you know, I've got all these threats and stuff. And, um, you know, the cops were like, you know, when I went to the, uh, the FBI or whatever the thing, the guy was like, you poor thing, you come from the Somali community. He's like, we intercept so much. <laughs> he's like, you don't know. He goes, we have a whole unit. He goes, we have a whole, he goes, forget about you being an ex-Muslim. He's like, wow, you have the audacity to leave Islam. He's like, no, we'll protect you. We'll do whatever. But he's like, we, he goes, we have enough of an outplate dealing with just the, co- the tribal feuds. He's yeah. like, we've got monitoring. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, you poor thing, you've got tribal. And then now you've added apostasy. Like, <laughs> you yeah. Sort of <laughs> I know strong. you just want to die. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know it's crazy, but yeah. anyway. But here's here's one thing that I'll say about um, Somalis. Okay, um, as much as their energy is raw when they're believers in in Islam, the energy doesn't go away just because they no longer believe. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they bring that same energy when, because they're they're prideful people as a whole. So then they bring that same energy when they don't believe. And they say, well, you're not going to make me do anything that I don't want to do, right? And so I think we're going to see exponential. And I think one of the reasons why Ayan Hirsi was pu- pushing through, even though she was a Salafist, right, is because she kind of, something clicked, right? And as the president of XMNA, and I'm taking a little bit of a tangent here, um, uh, if you permit, but what do you think that click is? Because you, myself, Noon, like we were all born Muslims. So what is that say- click? A lot of it is being sort of having a missionary zeal. Um, that can be for human rights. That can be for religion. That could be for a variety of things. So growing up myself, for example, I viewed Islam as humanistic and uh, ju- for justice. So advocating for Islam was a positive step in the world. When you realize that as false, the same impulses that were animating you to preach for Islam animate you to do other human rights related work. So it's the yes. same kind of person. Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I would presume that the same happened with Ayan in the sense that she was probably an, a loud, outspoken person that believed in certain things. And when she saw her beliefs were false, she went on the opposite side and advocated for them as well. Um, so I, I don't know if you could, was, are you able to bottle that, <laughs> that, that, that click that happens, you know, that, that, that little... Um, so the switch uh, itself is basically yeah. talking about these issues, right? So um, again, speaking about myself... Um, I studied Islam because I wanted to be a better Muslim. A few of my friends went really conservative and that uh, scared me because I thought they were going into a a fundamentalist jihadi type route and I didn't want them to. And my perception of Islam was very different. So I was, okay, I'm going to study Islam. I'm going to prove them wrong and pull them back. And the allegiance to truth, the allegiance to actually figuring things out allows you to move past these. And one of the issues that often happens is that when you leave, um, a lot of people are scared because they haven't seen other people like them. They haven't ever heard about it. And what we're doing right now is changing that narrative. So when somebody leaves, they're like, okay, I know about these evil ex-Muslims. Now I'm one of those evil ex-Muslims. <laughs> yeah, and I'll true. join them because they were actually <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's the dynamic that I was the only, I was scared, I was alone, does not really exist because they're aware of it, even if in an opposition. So 
right. the more arguments we put out there, the more our faces and our ideas are visible to them, the more rapid this change will happen. And I would I, say it's remarkable how rapidly it's already happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, one of, one of the, my favorite phrases and, and that you coined, I believe, uh, is normalizing dissent. I, I yeah, love, love that, that. that phrase because it's so true. Once we become normalized, then it's no longer this alien. Because you're right, even myself, like one of the reasons why I kind of started looking at this, because just like any other Muslim, I never really opened up the Quran or the Hadith. Or, no, I just celebrated you know, Eve. Whatever your parents told, told you. Yeah, I fasted mm-hmm. when, you know, and it was a competition more than anything spiritual, to be honest with you. <laughs> so then I did those things. But then what happened was I got, uh, I encountered um, a Christian friend of mine who was basically telling me how I believed in a cult, right? Now, <laughs> I had to prove him wrong, obviously, right? Because you have that, 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 that pride pumping. And so I, for the first time, started looking at the scriptures, so when I look at my Quran now, I see the places I highlighted of good bits. And now when I look back, those good bits are few and far in between, right? <laughs> Most of it is the highlight, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> so th- th- that's when you get a certain awakening. That's when you get a certain awakening of, of, of the mind that says, wait a minute. But then there's the rage period, right? Where you're like, I've been lied to this whole time. I've been lied to. Because it took me, right. my, I, was, I was in my 30s when I started doing that. It's not, it's not I'm, I'm not a kid anymore, right? So I was like, yeah. wow, I've been lied to my whole time. It's this rage period that comes, along, comes around, right? So you're right. And one of what I tell about to Muslims most of the time when we're arguing back and forth is if you want to remain Muslim, please stay away from reading the scriptures. Just don't read it. <laughs> Just don't read right, it. Right, right. I think it's a Mark Twain quote, quote, the surest cure for Christianity is reading the Bible. That applies to Islam as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It but you know, I, I just wanted to say, guys, I just wanted to correct you guys because I do feel as though, you know how Kahani said, what's the, what was the moment? What's the aha moment? And I, and I know exactly what you mean, right? Um, I do think that it is different for men and than it is for women. Like for me, for example, you know how you were saying, Muhammad, um, a young is probably an, an outspoken person and, you know, da, da, da. it's kind of like myself. When I kind of reflect on Ayan, I've read all her books. Um, and I, I, what I would say is it's like a chicken before the egg. Like I'm not going to lie, I'm outspoken and I'm a fierce person, you know. Um, but is it because that I come from a culture that forces docility on me, that demands that, you know, these really ridiculous rules on me? Or is it, like, I don't know if it's the... Um, one before the other because i i do feel like sometimes i wouldn't be um like i feel that islam um was like a, a constant um fraction uh, sorry a friction in my life you know what i mean like me wanting to do things in my life and it was constantly i was constantly being held back or told that i was wrong mm-hmm. or there's something wrong with me because of the religion of of islam right um i just wasn't good enough i wasn't you know the right yeah, whatever enough you know what i mean so I just feel as though, as a woman, um, for me, coming to research Islam and studying it, like that came after dealing with Islamic culture, dealing with the actual, because the culture is all so about misogyny, control women. The misogyny, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. The misogyny, the, the real patriarchy. You know, these Western women, these Western feminists are like squinting around for rape culture. And, you know, that are, <laughs> is that a pay gap? Is that rape culture? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, like I have, I've experienced rape culture. I've been told by the men in my family that, you're a whore for wearing jeans. You know, if something happens to you, it's your fault. Like that's the real rape culture, you know, Um, people trying to marry me off at young ages and stuff like that. That's the reason why I question Islam. Me, I'm feeling suicidal at nine years old. Like, you know, it's only until I read, um, like I'm a big fan of Richard Dawkins, but it's only until I read his work that I realized that, oh my God, I've experienced real child abuse because I went to Islamic school, right? At, from age four to 13, right? Um, and I remember as a young child hearing about Aisha marrying um, Muhammad. And as a child, you don't know, you can't decipher these things, right? So all I remember thinking as a five-year-old was, I hope to God I never turn nine because I never want to be married. Because I remember when I was young, I used to have a brother and boys and I used to hate boys, you know? So I was like, I never want to, you know, I never. So I used to think if I die before I'm nine, I'll die and I'll go straight to heaven. I, it would be a win-win situation. I'll never get married to a boy. Um, I just, you know, so, but it, it only, it dawns on me now as an adult, like how 
sad that is that I had like suicidal ideation as a child because I generally thought every nine-year-old girl gets married to an old fart. You know what I mean? So this is the reason why I started questioning Islam. As It's like MC Ashram said it the best. He's like, it's not that I learned anything new in my adulthood that made me like, okay. Like, so people act like, for example, Muslims are like, what happened to you? Like, I mean, did somebody hit you over the head with a kitab and that's why you hate Islam? You know? <laughs> exactly. Like, that, that's what they act like. Some, some, some moment happened. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but it's not that. It's like an accumulation of like the same things that I was okay with at five, at sixteen, at twenty. I could no longer say we're okay at twenty-five when my brain fully developed. I, I couldn't. I'm just like, well, tolerate hold it up. anymore. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't tolerate it anymore. So yeah, yeah. No, so for what it's worth, um, yeah. we did a survey. We haven't released the results. We're shorthanded. Um, we are working on releasing them probably sometime this summer. Um, of attitudes of why people left Islam um, and um, demographics and a bunch of other things. And one of the most stark differences was what in genders and why people leave Islam. For women, a lot of it, majority of it was because of misogyny within Islam. For men, a lot of it was based on science and philosophy and flaws within mm-hmm. Islam. For women, the plural mm-hmm. majority was because of misogyny. Right. So it was more, it's, it was you, more of an existential thing for women, is what you're saying, yeah. right? And as you can tell, um, a lot of, and I just looked at the uh, <clears throat> Somali uh, uh, ex-Muslims, essentially, and the most outspoken ones are majority women. Right? They have I mean, to because, go through so much more, right? They have to go through so much shit. Yeah, absolutely. With a, a ex-Muslim man, you can fly under the radar. With an, as an ex-Muslim woman, you can't fly under the radar because there are expectations of marriage, there are expectations of how you'll behave within the community. A man can get away with a lot more than a woman can. That's true. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's absolutely true. And that's something that I think, and I don't know if you agree with me, uh, Mohammed, but um, just five years ago, just half a decade ago, the conversation wasn't here, right? Just only five years ago. How do you think the ex-Muslim movement has moved on and matured and 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 because you because i think you went to hannity you've been to a lot of different platforms you've been to, and you you and yourself and uh, sarah hater as well shout out to sarah hater um you guys have moved uh, along the the, the 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 you basically had this movement that that, that started right so let tell us a little bit about that and how you feel it has progressed and uh from where it was like just only five years ago only three years ago actually so the positives and negatives in the sense that um, mm-hmm. I would never imagine we would achieve this level of success we have. Like it's everywhere. People talk about it. And the most hilarious part is now counter ex Muslim Dava is a huge industry. That has <laughs> yeah, I love, that. I love it. Every country. <laughs> so um, true. I love it. Um, yeah. One yeah. In Australia, there was a conference in Australia where they played Sarah Heather's videos in the oh, conference. Really? Yes. Really? <laughs> they were basically shitting on her. I missed it. I wish that, I, wish I <laughs> went. Yeah, so we were live streaming and we were watching it live. <laughs> I was watching it live stream and tweeting about it. Like okay, most of what they were God. saying was ridiculous, but the fact that they were introducing explosives on their own platforms for us is a win-win. They'll go and look it up. Absolutely, um, absolutely. But those concerts were happening man. over here in the U.S. Um, in uh, the U.K. Um, in the U.S., there's an institute that is working specifically on ex-Muslim-related issues. Um, it's, they, they feel the pressure now. Um, Bilal Phillips had a video recently or so ago about how... I uh, hate Bilal Phillips. Phillips. He's, yeah, but he's, he's in the heat because he's again and again getting confronted by ex-Muslims. Um, parents are referring their kids to him. And um, mo- <laughs> the, what, the person that triggered... Uh, that the video that Bilal Phillips put out was a member of XMA. Like he met yes. Bilal Phillips, talked to us about it afterwards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bilal God. Phillips is an idiot though. Like he's an, like, I, I'm just saying, even as a Muslim, like I thought he was an idiot. He was like, he's, he's an yeah. ultra conservative. So you have to be an ultra conservative. He's ultra, yeah. yeah that's true. So on the one hand, it's beautiful and wonderful how far we've gotten and how many other people are. So my goal from the beginning was to one, create an institution that will last for a while, like regardless of whether I'm around or not, and two, to broaden the movement as much as humanly possible. So most of our programs have worked in that direction. So we created a series of um, documentaries. Uh, we call them Life Beyond Fate. Mahat was featured. Jamal was featured. Yeah. I've seen those. A lot of the, those got a lot of traction, and as a result of that, like when Jamal's video came out, a lot of uh, Somali ex-Muslims came out immediately afterwards. And also, mm-hmm. within the Black American ex-Muslim communities, um, they 
sorry, black American Muslim communities, they played those videos and they were asked what's going on within our communities. Uh, Amna Wadud is a prominent feminist uh, Muslim. And she posted about the video and what are we doing wrong that this level of abuse is actually happening. So from a penetration perspective, it's been wonderful. Um, the other side of it that it has not been so wonderful is I wouldn't have expected um, how far liberalism has retreated. So mm, okay, expect us to be embraced. Like the, I, I used to joke when I was younger, before I was involved in any of this, that I'm the most left-leaning person you will ever meet. And <laughs> going from there, realizing how much we're hated by the political left, um, yeah. to me was heartbreaking. And I understand what the motivation is. Like it's to a certain extent, it's reactionaryism on how Muslims are demonized. And they want to protect Muslims, which is perfectly fine and legitimate. And they should be doing that. And they should be applauded for that. But yeah. it's hard for them to distinguish between defending these people that are being besieged and defending their ideas. Because if we're defending these people, their ideas must be an integral part of them. And we must defend their ideas as well. Like it's a package. They can't see that people that have bad ideas must also be defended. So that's, I think, where the dichotomy lies. And that's something that personally has, I felt hurt by that is very mm. true because could, could it be that because we're not there yet maybe maybe they just don't know enough about it and it's just they see the person and the ideology as one package one of the most um poignant videos that i've seen is i think it was armin navabi and i think i'm not sure where he was but anyways he was going to a a place where there was a, a muslim reunion or whatever or there was a muslim thing going on and the Muslims were more, <laughs> were kinder oh, yeah, to him. That's what we did. So we it, sent yeah. a bunch of our people to uh, ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. They have that's an correct. annual conference in Houston. It's in Chicago, yes. Houston, which is, so we got our... Some yeah, of I believe our it was in Houston. Texas. This one is in Houston, I believe, yes. So we got some of our people from Texas and Houston and Austin to show up, and Armin went there, and we hired a, a videographer as well. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw that Muslims, some Muslims were dismissive, some were angry, but yeah. I would say a majority of them were understanding and wanted to talk, wanted to understand our perspective. The thing right. is within the Muslim community, you don't know how badly people are being oppressed. Um, when true. I was a Muslim, I didn't know that in my country, in Pakistan, you have the death penalty for leaving Islam. You have the death penalty for blasphemy, which is in effect the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and most Muslims don't know that. It's a lack of awareness. They're not bad people. And when yes. they talked to those people, they were receptive, they understood, they, wa they want a better world as well. But yes. when they talked to people that were there that were not Muslim, the reaction was totally different. And it was Basically, violent. You guys are evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it was, was violent. Bad. I couldn't, I couldn't believe yeah. it because it's like they, they, they were virtually, that was virtue signaling to the <laughs> umpteenth degree because they were like, no, no, we don't want to talk to you. And I'm like, if he didn't tell you he was ex-Muslim, you were probably just assuming he was Muslim, right? Exactly. And that's the, that's right, the, that's right. the I, don't, I don't know. I, I think because, I think the for me anyways, I, the way I see it is, I, I don't feel hurt about it. I, I think maybe as a black woman, I've always experienced the kind of patriot, um, the patronizing kind of talking down to of left um, wing activists, especially, I'm just growing up in Australia, in the state that I live in, um, you know, it's a very, we call it the social state, the social state of Victoria. Um, um, but it, it's so I, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with that. For me, the way I see it is the left is extremely racist. And when I say extremely racist, um, like, I think all Western, most Western lefties are racist because, you know, they always talk about dehumanization. It's their favorite word to use. Um, but, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, why is it that only Western Black Lives Matter? What happens to the Black Lives Matter in Somalia? You know, because they're Black yeah. Lives right there. You know, we have Somalis screaming, defund the police. I'll tell you somewhere where there's no police funding. It's called Mogadishu, Somalia. Trust me. You go there, there's no police anywhere. There's inside, no police to know? fund. There's no police to fund. You know, there's no funding and there's no police. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and I just feel like they're extremely racist because whenever we want to expand the talk, topic of, you know, Black Lives Matter, what about Libya? Since 2011, the same witch that Americans um, wanted in, like the Clinton, she destroyed Libya. You know what I mean? Um, and now we've got black people. You know, they say the West is obsessed with historical injustice. You know what I mean? No one's interested in the current injustice. Libya right now, we have Ethiopians, Eritreans, Somalis, um, you know, Sudanese, Nigerians, um, Liberians having their 
organs taken out. You know, in Egypt, we've got the same thing happening. Other places in the Middle East as well too, we've got abuse of real life black people, real life current black people. So I just wonder. Oh, what are the slavery whatever, markets that happen? But I haven't heard about this like, issue. Yeah, there's no. So the organ issue is something that I feel like it's in our community. Like we hear about it because. Obviously, I've got cousins that live in refugee camps and stuff like that. So they tell us like the stories within. It's not. It's not reaching the mainstream media because, of course, these people don't matter. They're not human enough. So you know what I mean? The They're not Western. I would say personally, is that right? It's not the mainstream media won't take pay attention. Of course, um, of course it's not. on us to make that happen, anyways. So that's one of the reasons with the Life Beyond Faith videos. The reason we did that was we have to tell our own stories. We Absolutely. can't wait for third parties to become nice and care about our issues. We have the power, we have the resources, we can build the resources if you don't have them, and we can make that change anyways. That's how generally throughout history changes happen. The people in power aren't ever the ones that say, okay, you poor person are suffering, we will fix the world for you. People without power are the ones that get band together and stand up and say, fuck you, we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to fix everything around us. And that's where we are. Absolutely. I mean, I just not met the people in power. I met um, sort of, I guess, left-wing <clears throat> activists that will come and chastise ex-Muslims but for wanting to correct coming from the same, They have their yeah. own power structure, right? They're uh, yeah. embedded within a certain power structure and they have their certain dogmas, whatever they are, like regarding Muslim innocence and ex-Muslim being evil or uh, the power dynamics that colonialism is the only thing that really matters. And they're right. constant that. And it doesn't really right. matter what they think or don't think. We have the truth on our side and we have a lot of people that agree with us and it's a matter of us bind, binding together creating the institutions we need to change things and changing them anyways like that's how throughout history things have happened yeah you're right that's you're true. right you're right that's true now you guys are yeah, way, right. you, you guys are very very interesting and now I, I won't let you guys go but i just sort of get through the points because uh we want to get no, that's a, okay. uh, go ahead that's okay go ahead. maybe we can maybe we can make muhammad uh say that he's going to come back on another time because i don't think we'll have time to have all of the conversation we want to have <laughs> really yeah yeah make him make him promise on air that he's gonna <laughs> he's of gonna course, come of course <laughs> all right i won't promise so, about when but i will definitely <laughs> no of course not. we can always work that out um so i sent you um the uh Kahadin article um, and, yeah, yeah. and, and, and it was just not just Kahadin, but it was also um, Ayale. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, they, they run this uh, page called True Freedom Somali page um, on Facebook that has over 80,000 uh, followers, right? Yeah. Now, as being a part of that uh, page, you'll see that there's a lot of lurking going on, right? <laughs> and not, not enough participating, uh, to be very honest with you. But the conversation is being brought. So are there, and I'm sure there are, are there similar things in like uh, in the Pakistani community where there's like the, the Muslims and the non, uh, the ex-Muslims or the non-Muslims are all kind of having this chatter? And so it's ha- gone. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I was saying that it was a lot more until recently. So in the past few years, the Pakistani government has gotten, so that's pros and cons between Pakistan and Somalia. Somalia, the Somali state isn't as strong as the Pakistani state is. So the Pakistani mm-hmm. state is able to enforce its will to a much greater extent. So mm-hmm. what they did was their intelligence agency infiltrated a lot of these groups, found the uh, leaders within the groups and arrested them. So a lot of people are in jail right now in Pakistan on blasphemy charges and as a result, a lot of these groups, obviously, with their leadership taken down, people are afraid. They've gone quiet. Mm-hmm. Groups have themselves gone away. So Pakistan has very effectively tried to stamp down on it. Okay. Okay. So, and you're right. In, 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 in the Somali parts of the world, it's not, that's not necessarily happening. Right. Um, yeah. There's more vigilante, vigilante justice than uh, state justice. Right. right. Um, so, yeah. So the, the article was on BBC, as a matter of fact. And uh, maybe I'll... Awesome. Uh, which is great, right? And, yeah. and, and, and these are Somalis, and these are people that are in the Kahadin. I don't know if you've, uh, she often speaks in Somali, so maybe you haven't had the pleasure of uh, uh, seeing her videos, but she is very well outspoken. She's a true feminist in my books, anyways, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. She's a true feminist. And I, I know you like her too, uh, Noon, and uh, we're hoping to get her on. But that article essentially, it's not so much about what it was talking about. For me, at least, it was more so the fact that that article exists now. <laughs> it's in the ether now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's the and fact I, that an article about... It validates your existence as validates mm. what you're doing. Absolutely. And so, yeah, maybe maybe that's... Uh, I've seen this growth, right? So this is something that I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit and what you guys think about that. 
So I was going to say, it's really positive that um, the elders, like Kaha's a lot older than us. And um, and I think there's that Raza as well. Too. There's another guy, Raza. What I think is really positive about it is they speak purely in Somali. Like I can't, I, I can understand Somali, but I can't really speak it well. Um, you so it. you're good. I, yeah, mm. sure, you know what I mean. Um, but you know, you know, yeah, um, but with them, they, they're able to kind of speak to the elders, right? Because they're speaking fluently in Somali and they're able to challenge, like Razak, he's obviously knowledgeable on um, Islam. And, you know, so he's able to challenge Islam in Somali. Mm-hmm. And I think that is so powerful um, because it exposes these arguments to like a whole different generation of Somalis, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really powerful what Kahadin and Razak are doing. Shout out to them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. so I, I, well, you, I know you read the article was, we discussed it a little bit, Mohammed. Um, so I was just wanted your thoughts on that. I thought it was a wonderful article. One of the points that they made was the fact that um, pointing out the fact that Islam is not untouchable changes the perspective. The fact that you can <laughs> blaspheme, the fact that you can talk about the problems within Islam and you survive changes the mindset of a lot of other people. So <laughs> the fact that they created this, the fact that it's sustained, the fact that so many other people are joining uh, allows other people to explore their doubts. It give, opens up the space dramatically. So usually right. what happens is that if you, that you're talking about the professor that talked about desalination and just talking about desalination was enough to get him imprisoned. On the other hand, you have all these people that are, are from an Islamic perspective, pure evil. And they're standing up there and they're talking about it and there's nothing mm-hmm. anybody has been able to do. And they're going, going from strength to strength. That creates a lot more space where people on the other side are able to say whatever. And the focus shifts to people like Ayanle. Uh, and... That's true. The dialogue changes dramatically where a lot of people in the middle, people that have doubts, they're able to explore them, they're able to talk with their friends and the conversation will be, okay, at least you're not as bad as that person, but then you are able to have that conversation. That's true. That's true. That's so true. That's so true. I thought that, it, the, the fact, I don't know, I was a little bit like starstruck with the fact that the article was out there. <laughs> like, I mean, I've spoken yeah. to Ayale, I've spoken to Kaha, uh, great people, uh, by the way, and, uh, you know, pioneers in their own right. But the fact that that was on BBC is like five years ago, you wouldn't have never seen this. You, I mean, it would have been more about, you know, Ayan Hirsi Ali and just her mm-hmm. life being protected, right? So that, that's the, that I was really kind of taken aback with the fact that, okay, I, can, I think change is happening, but change is happening exponentially because of technology, because we're able to do this. We're in two different, three different countries and we're speaking right now, you know what I mean? And these things are advancing. And I don't know who said it, but so I heard, heard said that um, the internet was to Islam what the printing press was to Christianity, right? Information is being shared. Information yeah, is available that was never available before. People are able to read it and engage with it directly. So you don't, you can't get away from the fact. Back in the day, you could have an imam lying and the average person wasn't literate. They couldn't check anything. Now you can go and look it up yourself. Okay, as an ex-Muslim, I'm a complete liar, whatever. It doesn't matter. This is, these are the facts that I'm giving you. Go do your own research. Don't ever trust me. Go do your own research. And they're able to do the research and they're able to figure it out on their own. That's it. That's it. That's it. And, and, and you had said something earlier that I want to kind of circle back to. One of the reasons why I believe that we're making headway uh, in a little bit is the fact that a lot of these ustads, sheikhs, and all of them are all talking about people leaving Islam. Now, one of my favorite, and I think Noon knows this, is um, a Somali sheikh who's in Toronto, actually, Saeed Rage, and he's oh, the yeah, one. Yeah, our favorite sheikh. <laughs> our favorite sheikh. Yeah. And I think uh, it was Halima that uh, translated the words, uh, Mohammed, uh, <laughs> in XMNA. But he basically said it's not the riffraffs that are leaving Islam. <laughs> it's the most educated ones. He said it's not the drug dealers. He said it's not, yeah, the, it's drug not the drug dealers. dealers. He said it's not the ones that are shooting people in the street in, in, um, in Minnesota. He's, he, you know, I love the fact that he specifically <laughs> highlighted love it. the parents. I love that one. It's not the ones in jail. It's not the ones that are, yeah, just on the street corners. It's the ones that are doing studying science. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing because without him knowing, he's basically giving validity <laughs> to something that he doesn't So he was talking with. to what he actually experienced. Yeah. He saw yeah. this happening. Yeah. People probably in his congregation left. Parents came to him probably and said, my kid who is a bio major as a doctor is no longer <laughs> believing. Please talk to the kid. He had this conversation <laughs> and those conversations yeah. rattled him because usually within these conversations, what happens is yeah. the sheikh is not able to answer the questions. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. they've never been straight up confronted with it. And then they yeah. themselves get rattled. That's it. Because they've never really been questioned, to be very fair, right? They've never really been questioned. They've only been listened to. 
I, I remember going to a halaqa when I was a kid. Uh, halaqa is what do you call that? A lecture? Uh, I guess a, le- a religious lecture. Religious sermon and type thing. A ser- yeah, something like that. You, you weren't able to raise your hand and ask questions. You just had to listen. You were a receptacle yeah. for whatever information that was coming your way. As a matter of fact, right. it was almost right. impolite to ask questions or to question anything. That's why it's sami'na. It's sami'na wa ta'ana. I hear and I obey. It's not I hear, I critically think, and then I, you know, go forward. It's I yeah. hear and I obey. That's it. No questions. It's, 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 it's a cult that made it, right? And, and to me, that's, that's the thing that really kind of resonated with me. It's the fact that these chefs are coming out saying, apostasy this, apostasy that. The kids are leaving. It's, it's, it's the end of the world. <laughs> like, what's going on? And they don't understand. <laughs> that, well, just read this. Read it. Just read it, right? And it, 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 it's hilarious to me. And I think that's great. That's great that that's happening. Right. I'm sure um, some of the more educated ones are, would come to the same conclusions as well. But what do you do in that situation where as an imam whose entire life is tied into Islam and you realize that's false, what do you do there? Absolutely. Right? Your livelihood is tied into this, right? Even mm-hmm. the drug dealer mm-hmm. is gonna defend drug use. You understand what I'm saying? You're able to rationalize because this is how you make your money, this is how you make your kids eat. Like this is how you, you right. know, this is what helps you make your kids eat. So he's not gonna so and we're gonna get to that because I wanted to ask you uh, about something else. But maybe um uh, Noon, you wanted to talk about uh, Halima Ad and the, the model and Ilan Omar and the, the hijab, I think, right? And the hijab oh, the just mm-hmm. yeah, just briefly. What I wanted to ask you is, and I don't know that Muhammad would necessarily be on this. I don't know how big you are in fashion, Muhammad. Um, this he, guy's he's a fashionable guy. What are you talking about? I can tell. He was <laughs> <laughs> fashion, not as much. <laughs> I know. I was like, you know, you just, when seeing you, I'm just like, why aren't you on Vogue? Why haven't you been on Vogue yet? Um, <laughs> Look, and look, I just wanted to ask you about what your thoughts are on the phenomena of hijabi models, right? Um, so the reason why it's something that I feel, I really feel disturbed by the trend. I actually have an older sister, right? Who ironically, a whole another story, is a niqabi now. But so she's a few years older than me. But when I was young, um, she used to model, right? And she was like a swimsuit model and just like just a regular other model mm-hmm. and stuff like that, you know? Um, so you know, it caused a lot of drama for my family. It's a whole, you know, thing. But anyways, at the time, um, the modeling industry was extremely racist, extremely, like, I just remember my sister, my sister's really gorgeous, striking looking, but she's just like an inch too short. You know what I mean? And like, and I remember she would have weight issues and stuff like that. They would never give her, um, yeah. like, kind of concessions for it. Um, anyways, fast forward, like, it, it was so bad that my sister ended up quitting. So everybody in Australia, this community kind of knows my sister's being that model, right? So oh. she ended up quitting. This is years ago. This is years before the hijabi model trend. Now, years later, and my sister, for all intents and purposes, looks like a model, the thin, same sort of girl. Fast forward years later, and a new wave of model modeling. Like, you know, I remember when I was young, Vogue, Cosmopolitan, all these um, publications were extremely unachievable just for any ordinary girl. Now, I, have, we, I, I don't know, I just feel like the bigotry of low expectations has gotten to the point of, I don't know, the fashion industry, Joe Rogan and stuff has made the point of how there's overweight models now being put on, on um, the oh, covers. Yeah. But do you think that there's the same thing happening with hijabi models? Because in my opinion, I think a lot of the hijabi models would not be considered by the modeling industry had they not been wearing a hijab i feel like there's a there's a new um and for me i find it doubly confronting because obviously i'm an immodest girl that's from the islamic world and i have and i I am being told by no it's true it is i am being told by the men in my family that look even these westerners think the hijab is beautiful look and you are out here naked and a whore you know so i feel like it's that double um i don't know if this is making any kind of sense Yeah, it's a double stigmatization and, you know, from my community and in the West. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so I like, can't comment on the specifics of the fashion industry. I don't know enough about it. But okay. generally speaking, the issue, like, again, it's misguided liberalism where they want to mm-hmm. include minority groups. They want, they want to make them feel welcome. Um, you have a different outlook on the world. You have a different culture. And all of that should be included, which is, again, a, a laudable impulse. But the issue is that when you don't understand what you're actually endorsing, that can backfire in spectacular ways. So they're endorsing modesty culture, essentially. They're endorsing, yeah. the, to a certain extent, demonization of women and elevating mm-hmm. that. And that 
perpetuates it into the next generation. So a lot, of, it's, in my opinion, it is terrible. Um, so it goes back. Do you back. think it's a? Go ahead. Do you think it's an extension of? Honor, for me, I kind of sometimes interpret it as like an extension of honor culture and, and shame culture that's now, you know, cosmopolitan and Vogue. Is, I guess they, they're so doing it innocently. My, but Hijab actually yeah. represents that, sure, 100%. But um, if a conservative family has a girl that is um, on the cover of Playboy in a hijab, they will still have issues. It doesn't yeah, matter. For sure. for right? sure. So for it's, sure. it doesn't entirely map into it in the same way. We don't, like... Again, I said, we, this is something I often struggle with in the sense of putting off your Muslim hat when you were Muslim versus now. But in our context, if a girl is active publicly in any dimension, hijab, non-hijab, whatever, it's a problem. Um, If you're um, an actress, if you're a model, if you're doing anything that the public can see you, regardless of whether you're in an Islamic um, attire or not, you're viewed as something that is unclean, as something that um, is not desired. Um, so right. even with the hijab, they are still going through a decent amount of stigma. The problem, the bigger problem. Oh, absolutely. That's not discreet. Yeah. yeah. That's... The bigger problem my, from my perspective is that it makes it harder for young women that are suffering because they're going through this, uh, modesty culture and they want to mm-hmm. step out of it. And then there's a double reinforcement going on where not only are you getting it from your own culture, your own religion, then you're getting from the mm-hmm. outsiders. And I've actually heard about side. that again and again, where, ex-Muslims are afraid of white people because of the consequences of coming out to Mm -hmm. them. It's not Mm -hmm. just that our families will be bad. It's like, okay, I will be demonized by my actual friends that exist in the West for being honest about who I am. So therefore I can't be open. So it's I have been demonized by, I have been demonized and called, um, especially in white Australia, people are like, do you, is this, is this, are you trying to fit in? You know, that's that's what they assume. They assume that you've been bullied so much that that's the reason why you're abandoning Prophet Muhammad. That's the narrative that's given to them. That's (laughs) That's the narrative, narrative, yeah. That's the narrative that's to them, So, absolutely. And I think there's um, a lot of, there's a wave of uh, hijabi uh, YouTubers, right? (laughs) That are now taking out their hijab, right? Right, just kind of taking off their hijab and like it's, it's just exploding because uh, I'm not sure and I haven't followed her uh, before, but I, I saw this thing on the news where she was basically saying she was a she's a she has a huge following, but she was saying I was only putting on the hijab to make the videos <laughs> and that was not my real life, but now I'm right. just being myself and the amount of hate that she's getting is ridiculous. I think it's so, Dina um, Dina Tokyo, yeah. No, no, there's another sure, one. Another I, one I know about Dina. Oh, okay. or Togo. Oh, sorry, I forgot um, the name. But okay. I don't know if you've heard of uh, like Linda Sarsour. Um, oh. She had an article a while ago where yeah. she was basically, before I put on the hijab, I was just a white girl from Brooklyn. Like the hijab oh, is what God. actually made her into who she is. And that goes back to how Western perception is often so messed up where they want Muslims to represent a certain ideal. You have to be covered. You have to be modest. You have to be this ultra conservative for you to be even considered a Muslim. Otherwise you're not really a Muslim. Um, If you look at the stats for hijab, the majority of Muslims don't wear hijab and they're not represented anywhere in Western leftist circles. And they're not there. If you look at the women's March, for example, that happened um, after Trump was elected, um, all of the women that were on stage that were Muslim were hijabis, except for there were a couple of African American women, um, that were from like a different strain of Islam that weren't wearing the hijab. But um, if you look at Pakistani Muslims, if you look at Indian Muslims, if you look at uh, Arab Muslims, not, a variety of them don't wear the hijab. So why in w- the women's wars were they all represented by hijabi women? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And you know, you just, I just want to pick up on that point that you just made about Linda Sasso being a white girl. That is so, that to me just hits the, to the, the core of this issue. There's this kind of narrative, like in, when I was a Muslim, my perception of Arabs and there were white Muslims. Whiteness wasn't something that was outside of the Ummah. It was absolutely within the Ummah as well. Absolutely. So this kind of notion that somehow uh, Arabness ident- erases your whiteness in the Islamic context. Do you get what I'm saying? It's yeah. this kind of, it's this, um, what do you call it? Re, um, I can't find the word for it. Um, but what I mean is, the, the notion that Linda Sassor is a woman of color is a very modern thing. It's just, this is in the last 10 years, really. Arabs never even used to look at themselves as a person of color. If you told an Arab 15 years ago you're a person of color, they'd be like, excuse me? What are you trying to say? You know, like, they, they don't see them, they see themselves as like, yeah, so in this kind of, it goes into this, this kind of false um, liberal 
Western narrative. And I, and I put asterisk Western because I think it is important. People forget that Muslims are 2 billion in the world. You know, there's 33 armies and I think however many countries. So it's not like these, they're an oppressed minority within the West. And I think we need to constantly remember that, you know. Well, how many Muslims are there in the West to begin with? It's like a tiny percentage. 2% of global yeah, Muslims exactly. or something, maybe 3% are in the West. Exactly, they reproduce exactly. at a higher rate, though. They do reproduce at a higher rate. Right? But yeah. compared to the global population, like Pakistani population is around 200 million. Yeah. Um, in America, there are 3 million Muslims. In Canada, there's probably less than a million. Canada is a smaller country, I'm sorry. Um, same with France, same with other, other countries. There aren't that. Of the US. Exactly. Yeah. So we talk about them like as if they're a minority, forgetting that they've got, you know, this two, half a significant portion of the world and armies and governments and, you know, the OIC. And you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. pretty powerful groups are Muslims. So and I think we really need to keep that in mind when, <coughs> when having this discussion. Well, that, 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 the same way that white... Mm. I don't want to use these words, but it's, it, I'm just going to use them yeah. just so you understand it. Well, the same way white supremacy, and I'm using the quotes, uh, in, is imbued in, in Western societies, so is Arab supremacy in Muslim societies, right? right. Um, and I'm not sure to which extent. I often have conversations with family members telling them, you're not Arab, you're Somali. And, 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 and if you go back to anthropology, archaeology, we existed long before. Some long people are before. offended by that. And some people, people will get offended by that. And they'll say, no, 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 no. We come from Arabs because our lineage will go back to the prophet mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> he never came here. Like, it's not, a, uh, okay, I should probably correct that. Yes, Muhammad and his first Hijra came to East Africa, right? So he came to Ethiopia. No, he didn't come. Nope, he didn't he come. Didn't. He was his some first. of his people he did, yeah. Came. He's he never oh, sorry, came. he never came. But sorry. And it wasn't no. even, and let's be clear, it wasn't even the the. the the, the, the big Sahaba like Abu Bakr, it was some nobody. For what is worth, at that point, one. there were like 100 was, Muslims total. 100, yeah, Out of 100, like 20 went to some uh, Ethiopia or some Somali area. It wasn't Umar, it wasn't anybody. Was it was like, any of the Khalifs. That, that, yes. that was sent. Okay. That was sent you know? I, anyway, go on. I sit corrected. <laughs> I sit corrected. But what, what I'm saying is, they will use that and say, we were yeah. Muslim before the whole peninsula became Muslim, right? We So so then their Arabness kind of comes into play. Like, you're not Arab. Okay, well, you're not Arab. And these are actual conversations that are being had in the 21st century when all this information is available to us. Now, so I'm not sure to which extent I, Pakistani I communities wanna... aspire to the same. So I would say we're worse off than you guys are because Pakistan was founded on the idea of Islam. Like That's it was yes, India yes, and yes, India was split yes. into that Muslims want their own. Right, right. So for a lot of other countries, if you compare Egypt with Pakistan, or um, <clears throat> Morocco or Somalia, they have their own heritage that goes a long way. Pakistan's heritage <laughs> goes to India and there's a <laughs> significant discontinuity there where we're saying, screw India, yeah. we're yeah. Muslim. For the sake of Islam, yeah. for the sake yeah, exactly. of Islam. Screw so, India, for the sake of Islam. Yeah. So it becomes much harder for people in right. Pakistan to embrace their history in the same way that uh, somebody in Morocco or somebody in Somalia would be able to. Because you can draw on the entire two, 3,000, 5,000, whatever year old history in Pakistan. Pakistan actually is one of the oldest civilizations around. Um, mm -hmm. There were uh, re remains of civilizations dating back to 5,000 years, o as old yes. as Babylon, uh, that yes. exists in Pakistan. But yes. somehow Islam is when everything started. Like, um, yes. I grew up in Pakistan and our history books actually start from when Muhammad bin Qasim came in and invaded and opened, quote unquote, opened the door of India to Islam. Like, that's the narrative. So do they, do they teach, I wonder, do they teach the Ghazal Hind? Uh, Ghazal, uh, the, basically, I think it was one of the hadiths where the prophet no, said. I, in, I didn't yeah. see that hadith specifically, but the okay. people that invaded India and probably mm -hmm. murdered thousands upon thousands, if not and millions, raped? Yeah, yeah, are the and people that are lionized. Women. So there is uh, Muhammad bin Qasim that invaded uh, the lower part of India. Then there was Mahmud al Ghazni that invaded the northern parts of India, and it was Pakistan. And both of them are lionized, and we're taught in history books how wonderful they were. They destroyed temples. They enslaved people. They, um, with Mahmoud of Ghaz uh, Ghazni, I was reading where um, the global market and slaves plummeted because he enslaved so many people that there was wow. a glut in the market. And wow. we're taught that he was one of the most amazing people ever. Are you serious? Wow. Yeah. What was that's not say? Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, Mahmoud of Ghazni. So he, his empire was based in Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan, southern, like the Central Asian state. 
Um, okay. His name was Mahmoud of Ghazni. So is he like the one of the founding fathers, like Abraham Lincoln of, of Pakistan? Basically? So Pakistan is a recent like, state. Of, he was the one that recent, opened, they destroyed the border uh, empires within India, the Hindu empires or Buddhist empires, so that right. future invasions were easy to do. Was he Arab? Um, but can I ask you a question? Uh, Turkic. Turk, okay. Well, Okay, can I ask you a question on this? Because this is fascinating for me. It is. But wasn't wasn't it like wasn't there parts of that area? So I'm talking about the Pakistan Afghani area that couldn't be um, like that resisted Islam for like hundreds of years. Like thousands. wasn't a pass through uh, like so there was a specific was a area. Um, I think yeah. it was called Kafiristan because of the fact okay. that they were able to resist Islam. <laughs> Are you until, serious? Like, Yes. Oh, yeah. For how long? Yeah. Like, Muslims yeah, exactly. called it that because they were yeah, able to conquer it. And it was a pocket of, yeah. I think, Buddhism yes. that persisted in Afghanistan for a thousand years. They were strong, yeah. Yeah. Oh and God. it only ended when the colonial era started around the 18, 17, 1800s. Yeah, they were surrounded. Died and they out. That's so yeah. fascinating. Oh, my God. <laughs> so look up Kafir. Stan in Afghanistan, and you'll see those people. Like, you know what? Noon, we should start a Kafir Stan in, uh, in in Somalia. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We need we need our own little spot. But no, these people hilarious. are really fascinating. I really want to know yeah. about them because they resisted Islam for like two hundred years or something, and they like they have fierce nearly a thousand, you know I mean? years. a thousand, a thousand years. years. Sorry, yeah. more, longer than that. Yeah, long. They resisted for so long. So it would be interesting to. So that just goes to show you that Islam never came as a peaceful thing. Like in that. You know, because these people were forced, you know, had had pressure on them to convert. Um, That's but, the other yeah. thing, though. What I what I figure out, like in Somalis, because in in the Horn of Africa, it was not, um, it was it was there was no war, right? Islam was not brought by by the sword, even though the the the, the repercussions had some fatal repercussions, but it was brought to commerce. Right, the Omanis, the, the, the from the peninsula. Oh, uh, that's actually not true. That's not actually I true because no, I haven't I was, read about that. But mm. often that narrative tends to be false. I haven't read about. I was going to say, yeah, it's not true. Really, it's not true because I was going to say, you know, the Sayyid, for example. Uh, there's a lot of people that say, you know, the founding father, you know, Muhammad Sayyid Abdullah, the guy that fought the British. Mm-hmm. A lot yeah, of the, people the say Mad Mullah. The, history, the Mad Mullah. The Mad Mullah. The Mad Mullah that fought the British and freed the Somali. He's like the the pioneer, like the, the grandfather of Somalia, right? So a lot of people say now, I've heard alternate histories that he was actually slaughtering non-Muslim Somali tribes. That oh. um, that because okay, basically what they say was the English uh, at the time and the Italians wanted to end slavery because the the Europeans actually had ended slavery or were stopping slavery, and the Somalis were offended by that. The Muslim Somalis, Somalis were offended I'm by I'm sorry, them. but we're slavers. Like Somalia yeah, we're slavers. Was, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, they were slavers. And that's Absolutely. how they made their money. So the Muslim Somalis were like, hell no, we're not stopping. Because the British were like, you guys need to stop. And they're like, we're not stopping, you know? So this guy came around and he was fighting the British. They say he's, part of his motivation to get rid of the British was how dare these white people come and tell us we can't be slavers. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, so mm-hmm. any Somali tribe, and there was a lot of Somali tribes that were like non-Muslim that were like, Yo, this is not right. You know what I mean? Like, let's not do this. And he'll slaughter them. Mm-hmm. Um, could you hold on one sec? I'll do- be right back. I'm having an ish- video issue. One second. Yeah, yeah. no problem. All right. So we got my back. I'm back. All right, back. Okay, we're back. Yeah, um, so, we, so I was just, because you guys just schooled me on something on how Islam <laughs> came to the Horn of Africa. And you guys said. No, I, yes. didn't, I did not. Uh, no, I, was did. Still no did. <laughs> I, I knew that it was generally false. I didn't know this was yeah, generally okay. false. Okay, so, cool, cool, cool. I just wanted to f- f- finish that story. So basically, let's say this is an alternate history. So people, the problem with Somalia is, is we come from an oral history. So there's going to be some dick in the comments yeah. like, oh my gosh, she's lying. She's a Catholic or whatever. Whatever, like we can't really prove these things because Somali is a hundred percent Muslim country. These Muslims are literally in front of us. Like we would love to do archaeological archaeological research and just research on things, but we can't do nothing because these people have the audacity to call us jahil. But that's enough conversation. Jahil, but jahil means ignorant. It's a matter of time, right? Like I wouldn't look at it that way. Out. Exactly. It's, today we can't do it. Tomorrow we will be able to do more. Exactly. It's a matter of changing the attitudes of people. Enough people get on our side where. I wouldn't even say our side, the side of reason. And then the situation changes and you are able to do the research. So one of the things personally that I would really love is archaeology within Saudi Arabia. Figure out the history of Islam itself. Right now, the regime over there is antithetical to that. They're destroying every bit of history that they can find. But eventually they will go down. More sane people will take over. And at that point, we will be able to figure out as much as we can. So I'm sure the same will happen in Somalia over time. 
I, I absolutely do do think that we will uncover exactly. You're right. It's a matter of time. It's not a matter of yeah. yeah. yeah we did we did discover want... some things on uh, like that's from ten thousand years ago, and um, there's a uh, a Somali archaeologist that studied in uh, Ningle. I believe her name is Sada Mire, and she's done some yes. some digs uh, in the Horn of Africa, um, especially in northern Somalia, and. Um, and so basically her having those kinds of digs and uh, there's a place called Las Gale, right? And it has yes. paintings from, I think, 10,000 years ago. Like 10,000 no, six years ago. Th- yeah, six to ten, yeah. About I that, mean, it's carbon it. dating, so take your Next door to worth. you guys is Kenya, which was the birth of humanity itself. I actually years said ago. those yeah, exact yeah. same word, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. believe it or not. I said yeah. those exact same word to my uncle today when he was telling me that we're from uh, Arabs. <laughs> I said oh, those you exact know, same words. <laughs> You know, we actually, there's actually a point that, that might interest Muhammad in the Lost Scale paintings. But, you know, they say now with the Lost Scale, like, you know, there's, so they're actually, so the paintings of Lost Scale is people worshipping a cow. And they say there's links between, um, like, Somalis and, like, ancient Hinduism, like the origins of Hinduism, like the beliefs being very mm-hmm. similar. Well, they've so, seen this, like, yeah. From what yeah. I've read, basically, in ancient history, when it, um, religious ideas began populating. Animism was a big mm-hmm. part, worshipping animals mm-hmm. because you got stuff from animals. So it was across exactly. the board. You could uh, see it in French cave paintings. You can see it in Somalia. You can exactly. see it in India. India is the only culture that actually sustained it till today. Right, yes. right. Well, people, people, people worship things that made sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're getting sustenance yeah. from this thing. This it's, thing must be wonderful. Exactly. Makes more thank, sense you, than uh, thank you, son. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> right? That's how it was, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, yeah. son. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, whatever around me. Like yeah, the gods exactly. were gods of fertility, the gods of <laughs> um, harvest. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Look, we're having a great time, guys. But I'm to move it along. Got a couple more mm-hmm. points that I want to kind of get okay. um, uh, Mohammed's uh, insight on. Okay. I don't know if you've uh, been following what's been going on. Um, Yasir Qadi, who's a very prominent, uh, <laughs> he knows already where I'm going with this. He already knows. Okay, so Yasir Qadi, who's a very prominent, I'm not going to I like Yasir Qadi. I'm not going to lie. I, I like him as a, as a person, right? I like him. Uh, who's a prominent uh, scholar. Uh, doesn't get any more educated than that in terms of uh, scholastic, I guess. Um, and he had an interview or whatever, a conversation with uh, Muhammad Hijab, who was a dude from Speaker's Corner, I think, or something like that. And he had basically said the following statement when uh, they were talking about uh, the preservation of the Quran, right? He said that the standard, and this is a direct quote from Yasir Qali, he said, the standard narrative has holes in it. So I'm not sure, and I think uh, our, our, our dear friends, uh, Abdullah Samir, Abdullah Gondo, um, uh, Introvert Smiles, shout out to all of them, by the way. Uh, I've all made like videos about it. I think a policy profit, I think also made a video about it. But anyway, what is your thoughts on that? I want, I want to know if you think Yasser Ali is actually in a apostate in the closet. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> do you start, answer that question. Answer, do, you, do you think... Do you so think I actually had a debate with Yasser Khadi a few years ago? And oh my god, went oh, very really? badly because he got really, really angry and really? trying to walk out. He was a bit, if you continue this attacking Islam, I don't want to be a part of this, I'm leaving. Wow, so I had to really? actually tone it down. Um, wow, so the level of offense he had to me would indicate a Muslim, like I, a former Muslim would not have that level of deeply being offended the way he was. Um, when was this? Uh, how many years ago? This was yeah. five, six years ago, a while ago. Oh, okay. uh, he sounds different now. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm saying, I don't know. Shame, no, no, I'm, 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 he's so he has well, changed. The thing he is, changed. he's an honest, in my opinion, an honest person. So there are yeah. okay. like there are a few Muslim scholars that are actually honest about the problems within Islam, and they're willing to talk about it. So uh, there's Jonathan Brown at Georgetown University. He talks about slavery. He talks about Aisha's age. Like the Islamic narrative is. 100% shows that Aisha was nine years old. There's no doubt in it. And he's willing to say that. Um, he's a devout Muslim. He believes in it. And he's, this is what God said. This is what the Hadiths are. Um, so I, I personally believe Yasser Qazi in that same frame. Like he understands okay. the problems that exist within the narrative, but his faith overpowers those narratives. So uh, okay. it doesn't matter what holes exist or not. We know what the truth is. I, I would say that I, might, I was that person 
a long time ago as well. Like when I was Muslim, I saw the slavery verses. I saw uh, the hadith about women being raped. Um, my perspective at that point was, I don't understand this. This can't be true because God is just, God is merciful. This couldn't have happened. I'm misinterpreting. There was something blinders. wrong happening over the there. The blinders come on. Yeah, the yeah. blinders there. So I'm sure there's something like that going on with these guys as well, where they, God can't do anything wrong. There must be a, a broader justification. So I wouldn't, personally speaking, say that they're atheists or ex-Muslim or anything like that. They just believe deeply and they, they're honest enough that they're willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads them. But not I really. just wanted to just clarify. They're not, following, they're not following the evidence where it leads them because if they were to follow the evidence where it leads them, the, you can't deny. No, you, can, you can't say that God desires certain things. There may be a broader element within God. Like, say, going back to the slavery part. So you yeah, you don't understand your, that. Okay, so exactly. there you go. Faith overrides that. So slavery exists within Islam and God must have a purpose for that. Right. So as a Muslim, mm, you're willing mm. to acknowledge that and believe that. From our right. perspective, it's like slavery is evil, plain, pure, and simple. And if God condones slavery, God is evil. Their perspective is if God condones slavery, there must be a reason. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that um, Yasir isn't a secret ex-Muslim. I do <laughs> think that... I, yeah, seriously, honestly, God. I'm, I don't know about this other person that you mentioned. You said Jonathan something. He sounds like a convert. Jonathan Brown, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a, convert. a convert. A convert is a writer. I'm sorry, Muhammad, but I don't see people that were no. What, I'm sorry to say, no disrespect to nobody. I don't see people that were born into Islam as the same as people that um like uh, converted into Islam. For example, for me, right? Um, a convert and me, we're not going. We're never going to have the same pressures on us. You know what I'm saying? Right. Jessica that converts into Islam, when she leaves Islam, it's going to be a different trajectory than somebody like me comes from a family that claims to come from Abu Bakr. Now we don't. That's not as true, but the fact, you know what I'm saying? Right now, I'm saying it, but I'm not really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'd probably get killed just for saying that in my family, but the, the truth is we're not related to Abu Bakr. Um, but you know what I'm saying? And so what I say about Yasir Qadi, my point is about Yasir Qadi, I think there's a lot more on him. I don't think people don't understand. Being an ex-Muslim, it's not um, for the faint-hearted. It's, you got to be really kind of tough, resilient within yourself. Um, as well as, I feel like your ego attaches to, you know, like, I don't know, I feel like there's so much, yes, so many different layers that Yasser would have to go through in order to come out and be openly ex Muslim. Do you get it? I don't, like, think, I don't, I don't know. think that's going to happen. I think there's a lot of. No, he would like, never be. Yeah. No, I think he would die. I think he would be killed. Like, do we forget that there's, yeah. a, like, there's death, you know, there's like a literal sword. Prever for prever he's American too, though. Sword. He's American oh, too. Yeah. Though. I don't know if he's going to die. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think I, my I think personal perspective is he is Muslim. He's got a lot of dissonance going on where he's basically that Islam is true regardless of what the facts are or are not. That's my perspective on it. Okay. Yeah, my perspective is that he's going to have a book saying when I believed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would say that that is possible, but that's also that book. where we I, make the world so difficult but, for yeah. people yeah, yeah, to yeah. exist in dissonance. It's our yeah, job yeah. to make it hard yeah, for them yeah. to exist in that way. No Muhammad will be back here discussing his book yes, if I will. was a non-believer. <laughs> you know how much Inshallah, brother. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. So, exactly. guys, uh, this is great. Right. I mean, we're going to ask you one last question, Muhammad, and uh, it's about uh, something that me and Noon would love to also partake in. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure yet. I've heard great things from my ex MA brothers and sisters. Is the Capricorn. So I want you to tell okay. us about how it started, how, um, and also Noon had a great question, which was, how do we go about creating ex-Muslim holidays, right? I mean, I oh, think yeah, celebrating yeah. things is a great thing. So some, that celebration when there's no more Eid or there's no more Ramadan that you kind of believe in, then how do we go about maybe establishing some ex-Muslim holidays? So maybe first start with how Capricorn came about, what's the concept, what is it about? I'm not sure so, if it's secretive or not, but... No, no, no. no I think um, it's so ultimately, uh, if you look at uh, Christmas, for example, Christmas used to be a winter solstice holiday for Romans mm -hmm. called Saturnalia, and it was converted into Christmas when Christianity came about. Um, if mm -hmm. you look at Islam, similarly, the main holidays were pagan holidays that they appropriated. 
Hajj existed before Islam. Hajj was turned into an Abrahamic ritual and converted into something within Islam. There's no reason we can't do the same. So we've <laughs> left Islam. If there are certain aspects that we feel fond of, we can re-engineer them into something that works for us. So, or we can create new ones as well. Both options are open to us. So um, with us, for example, what happened in the beginning was um, people missed Eid. There's a certain a family element to Eid, being around people mm-hmm. you care about, um, eating certain foods. And so we wanted to sort of recreate that. So the way it started was we started having um, what we call Harami Eid parties. And mm-hmm. uh, the idea was... Um, you create dishes and elements from your own culture. You dress up as whatever the culture is, be it Somali, be it Pakistani, be it Arab, whatever it is, and bring elements from that to the event. But make sure that everything you're doing is haram in one way or the other. And that's on you and how to make that happen. So, um, for example, there's in Pakistan, there's a dessert that's very popular called kulfi, sort of like a pistachio ice cream. And we made that with uh, Bailey's Irish liquor. Um, so we made biryani, uh, which is a uh, rice stew with uh, bacon. Uh, we, yeah. we, everybody was encouraged to come up with things on their own that would subvert elements of their own culture. Okay. And people enjoyed that a lot. Like some of the dishes were wonderful. Some did not pan out as well. Well, it was a fun experience with everybody. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but biryani, I don't want any bacon in my biryani. No, no, no. So <laughs> yeah, what what say, we did was, no, 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 no. What no? we did was we used um, hot Italian sausages in biryani. Okay. And they were wonderful. It came out mm. seriously. Really? Yes. I don't know how that would work, but okay. So Might we diced that. up hot Italian sausage, cooked the biryani. We should actually do an expo some recipe book at some point. No, yeah. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually so nice. uh, get, get Cindy pork, Biryani, pork which has potatoes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so people did come up with all sorts of ideas, and there were like there were Lebanese dishes with a variety of ways of making them haram. There was Pakistani dishes. There was Somali dishes. I I don't remember the specifics, but there were like twenty different dishes from twenty different cultures. Yeah, and awesome. People had a great time, and okay. I in full disclosure, some of them didn't turn out well. That's fine. <laughs> um, like one of the ones that I made it's a Pakistani dish called Halim and for whatever reason pork did not work with it it was horrible yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, as I said with biryani hot salad sausage worked great so yeah. that's sort of where the idea originated um, we had a couple of those and then it was um, we want to expand this to a national stage where we have people from all over and that's when the idea of Kafir Khan came to be Okay. where we started having uh, national events where we had people from all over the country, both countries, Canada and the U.S., where we operate, come together for a weekend where they were able to celebrate together, they were able to party together, they were able to enjoy each other's company. And uh, in certain instances, we also um, arranged it around something else happening. So last year, what we did was we had, we marched in pride. It's the first time in the U.S. Yes. that exposed to marched in pride. Yeah. And... Um, that was in New York, I think. In that was in New York, yes. Mm-hmm. And the wonderful thing was, so we were playing Indian music, we were playing Arab music, all the people, so what we created a Spotify playlist and asked all of the, the people in the support group of XMA to add whatever they think is interesting and danceable tunes. So we had this massive list from a bunch of different countries. And we played it on speakers and all of our people were dancing. And you had people from the outside that, due to the energy, due to how good the music yeah, was, oh, were dancing yeah. with us. So you yeah, had white awesome. people yeah. dancing with it. You had, um, so we had a little float where we had a rainbow kava. We built our own oh, little nice. kava and it was, oh, had a rainbow that. motif around it. And oh, sick. <laughs> um, the float before us was grinder. So, oh, cool. The grinder <laughs> people so were cool. dancing to our music. That's oh awesome. my God, that's so cool. <laughs> and one of the grinder awesome. people was actually an Arab. Oh, yeah. oh, he had never encountered this, and he was so shocked that this is possible. Like, wow, it felt like his mind was blown. Oh but, my god! Uh, so what we did, we had a whole like three day period where we had events throughout New York. We had picnics going on at Central Park. We had um, uh, uh, social with um, like sort of a party lounge type event mm-hmm. where we had, and then we had um, after parties. So it was a two to three day festival where actually most of them were getting together and having a great time and it was capped yeah, awesome. by uh pride where we marched we were there for a couple of hours the march itself was one or two hours and we were dancing to our music 
I saw a lot of videos. I saw a lot of videos. And it was wonderful. It was the best time. I think most of the excitement people have have had in years and years. Like how often do you get to dance with other Somalis, other Pakistanis to your own music out loud and proud as an ex-Muslim, as supporting LGBTQ rights? It's rather rare. Yeah, very rare. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm coming to the next... The next yeah, one, I was going to say, invite me to the next one. Invite me to the next one. This one is be postponed because of the pandemic. We were going to um, do one in August, but we're right. canceling that for now due to the pandemic. We're probably going to do one in 2021. 2021 is yeah. going to be our year. <laughs> That's what I keep saying <laughs> to my friend. <laughs> yeah, 2020 is a write-off, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a write-off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 2021 is, uh, is our year. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make it, uh, we're going to be coming to our close. Um, Noon, do you have any other pressing questions that you want to ask uh, Mohammed? Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll have to wrap let him up. go. Yeah, we'll have to um, wrap it up. No, I just wanted to say um, just thank you for honestly all the work that you've done. Like, Mohammed, I know, like, I feel like I know you. Like, now it's the first time I'm meeting you, but it's like I actually feel like I, I've known you because I've, you know, been following your work and, like, really been a fangirl of yours for so many years. So thank you for, for – thank you, firstly, for taking out the time to come today and, you know, um, talk to us as well as just like the way you've paved the way like people don't understand coming from especially outside of our world like the risks the pressure you know how how dangerous this is for you and how stressful and how much anxiety that you would have you know you're really selfless so i just wanted to say thank you on behalf of i think all the Sons for everything that you've done for us and for building xmna you know Absolutely. Really and um, just to carry up on that, like XMNA is a great our organization that I, uh, some of the some great conversations have been had. I've made some great friends um, uh, from, from there as well. Um, actually, Stephanie Tessier, we, 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 <laughs> we're about to go and uh, have uh, some drinks uh, together sometime <laughs> this, uh, this month. Um, but honestly, though, thank you to you, to Sarah, and to everyone that's really active. Yeah for normalizing dissent and for basically making us making you know all of us feel like we're not aliens and we've kind of found this niche where and honestly sometimes i'll see um i'll see posts on the xmna private facebook group where it's going to be a little bit disheartening it's going to be a little bit of someone going through a rough patch but the great thing is that there are a lot of us that on through that rough patch that can coach them through it, that can actually take them through it. And there's conversations that are being had. And I can say Mohammed is actually amazing at getting involved in all of these little conversations that are going on. I don't know how he does it, but he's kind of like an overlord. And he sees yeah. all these little fucking conversations going on and, and he'll intervene with some common sense and it's great. Um, so I want to just basically thank you, uh, Mohammed, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on uh yeah. the crazy somalis are out now and, <laughs> and there's mm-hmm. you know it's kind of like toothpaste you can't put it back in the tube so yeah, exactly. we're so out you guys are <laughs> so. where we were a few years ago like the broader ex-muslim movement like six seven years ago when we were starting up a lot of people were in the beginning stages i think the somali community right now is there and another five years you'll see that explosion where all the people that are Absolutely. in the closet and are thinking about it and are talking about it they'll start coming out everywhere and that'll change the dynamic dramatically and i'm honestly looking really 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 looking forward to it absolutely absolutely definitely, so um definitely. any parting words uh, besides that uh mohammed that uh you, okay well, here's a question that i want to ask and maybe we can finish on this what advice would you give the somali community in starting their own like ex-muslim movement understand that it will be extremely hard much harder than you can anticipate but the rewards will also be outsized. You're changing the world for the future for your children and their children. And this is a change that will persist forever. So if we don't do it, then who will? And there's no reason you can't change the world. Absolutely. If not, I love that. I love that. Not now when, right? So again, thank you so much for taking some time for us, uh, Mohammed. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on. Also. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.